Welcome to another edition of the Voice of Palestine, Voice of the Palestinian People. It's June 7, 2013, and I'm your co-host, Hanna Kawas. This week, we'll be interviewing Dr. Ismail Zayed from Halifax, a veteran Palestinian Canadian intellectual and activist. Dr. Zayed will talk with us about the 67 aggression and Israeli occupation of the rest of Palestine, as well as the Jewish National Fund and its infamous Canada Park built on the ruins of three Palestinian towns, including his hometown, Beit Nuba. Good evening to you, Dr. Ismail Zayed, and welcome again to the Voice of Palestine. Good evening to you, Hannah. Thank you very much for asking me. You know, uh, the so-called uh, Security Council Resolution 242 was passed in 67, and still after 46 years, it hasn't been implemented. Uh, is there something wrong with this United Nation, or uh, what, what do you think? Or are we uh, not uh, humans as the rest of the world to them? I'm afraid uh, it's not only Security Council Resolution 242, but there are scores of United Nations General Assembly and Security Council Resolutions that uh, continue to be defied by the State of Israel and the international community stands helpless and will do nothing about it. Uh, and this is very shameful business, uh, and uh, it, it's here, it appears to all people observers that as if, as if Israel is above international law, and, and Israel can commit any crimes it wishes to do so, and it does commit scores of war crimes, but nothing, uh, no, nobody is ever taken charge to apply sanctions or any action against Israel. Yeah, it, it, it comes to my mind what happened in Iraq when they invaded Kuwait, and the U.S. took it on its shoulder of evicting Iraq from Kuwait, and they did it in six months. Uh, you know, I, I think it's the responsibility also lies on the shoulder of this so-called imperial power, the, the only sole imperial power, the U.S., because without enabling uh, Israeli crimes, you know, the Israel can't uh, do much, really. Well, that's exactly what you said. In 1990, when Iraq illegally uh, invaded the Kuwait, one Security Council resolution was passed, and when it wasn't implemented within a few weeks, <laughs> nearly a million troops were sent and, and threw uh, the Iraqis out of Kuwait uh, and destroyed Iraq by sanctions and uh, flying, bombing, and destroying the infrastructure of Iraq. And yet, as, as you just said, <laughs> Israel is an illegal occupation of the Palestinian and Syrian territories, uh, and has been in this illegal occupation for, for 46 years, but nobody says, well, how about Security Council Resolution's implementation? Yeah, and only, not only that, uh, Dr. Ismail, but they are changing the map of the occupied territories by building settlements and, uh, you know, creating facts on the ground. Uh, well, completely. I mean, the activities of the State of Israel in the occupied territories um, uh, stand in violation of virtually every article of the Fourth Geneva Convention, and violations of the articles of the Fourth Geneva Convention are determined as war crimes by international law, but nobody pays any attention. I mean, these include um, the, the torture, the imprisonment without trial or charge, uh, humiliation, daily humiliation of Palestinians, demolition of thousands of homes, expropriation of property for the creation of illegal colonies or settlements, as they are called. Uh, all these are uh, violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention and uh, are defined uh, by international law as war crimes. Yeah, actually also including the transfer of population to the occupied Yes, yes. 
That's, so this uh, is the creation of settlements, yes. Uh, yeah, and, and sending prisoners to the uh, uh, non-occupied territories into Israel. Yes, proper, exactly, which, yes. Again, uh, a violation of the... Well, well, virtually every article of the yeah. Fourth Geneva Convention is violated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's clear, you know, uh, that uh, uh, the international community and uh, the, their puppet regimes in the Arab world are not really uh, serious and they are hypocrites really when it comes to the occupation of yeah. Palestine and justice for the Palestine in general because uh, as well you know you know, it didn't start with the 67 aggression it started in 48 and till now justice haven't been done yet well exactly yes it was a continuation the plan was the plan to in 1948 uh, the uh, Israel conquered 78% uh, of Palestine, but the objective was still to carry out and take the whole of Palestine as they did in 1967. Uh, Ben-Gurion, the Prime Minister of Israel, stated in 1954, the status quo will not do. We have created a dynamic state bent upon expansion. Mm -hmm. And that's what went on in 1967. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean the State of Israel when it was created in 1948, uh, Ben-Gurion refused to define its borders. Mm -hmm. it, Israel to this day is the only state in the world that has no defined borders. Yeah. Uh, and no constitution to define the borders. And, uh, no, exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, so it's, it's what they're saying that, you know, it was a defensive war, the 67 war, is really a, a big lie, isn't it? Well, that is absolutely so. The war of 1967 was planned and effected by Israel, and uh, statements by Israel's own leaders at the time confirm this. And I quote to you, if you wish, sure, yeah. um, the statement by Yitzhak Rabin, who was the chief of staff of the Israeli army at the time. He said, I do not think Nasser wanted war. The two divisions he sent to Sinai would not have been sufficient to launch an offensive war. He knew it. And we knew it. Menachem Begin, mm -hmm. who was a minister in 1967, stated uh, in 1968 when he was prime minister of Israel, he said in June 1967, we again had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai did not prove Nasser was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. And uh, Mordechai Bentov, who was an Israeli cabinet minister at the time, said, oh, you know, there were the stories that Israel was threatened with extermination and whatever it is, and that's why that war was waged. And Mordechai Bentov said, all this story about the dangers of extermination of Israel in June 1967 has been a complete invention and has been blown up a posteriori to justify the annexation of Arab territory. This is a statement he quoted in the Israeli newspaper Al Hamishmar on the 14th of April 1972. And uh, I mean, these are Israel's own leaders and clearly say that there was no threat of war against them from the Egyptian army at all. They knew it. And, but they decided to, uh, to, in, to invade yeah. Sinai and later on the Golan Heights and the West Bank and so on. Yeah. Uh, as stated here clearly. And, and it is, you know, the, the length of the occupation, uh, uh, 46 years, is really uh, a proof that really they want territory. And of they're course. doing it uh, even uh, uh, against uh, the so-called peace process. I mean, they... Well, this is exactly as, as Mordechai Bentov just told you. Yeah. It was just a story created mm. to justify the annexation of Arab land. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, and uh, in spite of their talk about peace and wanting peace, really, they, they really want uh, the, the pieces of land rather than peace. Yeah. Yeah, the there is no, ob Israel wants mm. territory yeah. and will not, is not interested in any peace. And they've been talking about a peace process for decades and decades and nothing is happening. Yeah. And the Palestinians get dragged into these negotiations to no avail. 
Yeah, the leadership, you mean, because yes, they, yes. They, they can't drag me or drag you into it. No, 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 I'm talking about the Palestinian leaders, <laughs> yeah, yes. That's it, that's it. And, uh, you know, I just want to ask you, we'll, we'll come back to these leadership, these uh, bankrupt leadership later on, but I want to ask you first about your experiences <laughs> during the uh, 67 war, and uh, uh, you could tell us a bit about what happened to your town. Well, uh, the tragedy, of course, on as as uh, we just indicated uh, israel planned this war and on the 4th on the 5th of on the 5th of june 1967 waged the war against Sin in against the egyptians in sinai and also invaded the west bank which was under jordanian control um, and on the 6th of june the, uh, the three villages uh, Mwas, yalu and beit muba my own hometown yeah. were occupied without a single shot being fired and they were systematically dynamited and bulldozed uh, and destroyed uh, and wiped out from the face of the Holy Land completely. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, at the direct orders of Yitzhak Rabin, who was the chief of staff of the Israeli army at the time, and who is and the Nobel Peace Laureate, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And and this is the destruction of these villages, as as I said already, is in violation of Article 53 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Fourth, uh, the Article 53 of the Fourth Geneva Convention mm -hmm. says says clearly, uh, and I I quote it to you here. It says any destruction by the occupying power of real or personal property belonging individually or collectively to private persons or to the state or to other public authorities uh, or, or social or, or cooperative organizations is prohibited, uh, and it is a war crime. And, and this is, these three villages was, were completely dynamited and bulldozed, uh, and population of around 10 to 14,000 people were driven out, and we, my family and us, we were all driven out and there became refugees, in, some in Jordan and some uh, in, uh, in elsewhere. And, uh, and uh, despite the fact that in 1967, a Security Council resolution was passed all calling on the refugees who were driven out, about 350,000 refugees mm -hmm were driven out in 1967 by the Israelis out of, out of the Palestinian territory into Jordan and so on. And yet Security Council resolution uh, in, in June 1967 was passed that the refugees must be allowed to return to their homes uh, at the earliest possible opportunity. And this is, has never arrived at 46 years, 46 years later, the refugees have not been allowed to return to, the, yeah. to their homes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, the, my, mm -hmm. my personal pain, pain was compounded when I, I was invited here to come to Canada uh, to teach at the university here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, my personal pain was compounded when I read on December the 4th, 1978, in our Israeli newspaper, the Halifax Herald, that Peter Hershon, a prominent Halifax businessman and past chairman of the Atlantic branch of the Jewish National Fund, fund was honored by the JNF for his humanitarian work in building Canada Park. <laughs> Canada Park was a, a structure built to create picnic areas for, for, for Israeli uh, oh seeking fun and enjoyment mm -hmm. on the ruins of these three villages and this is the what is to my shame as a Canadian to the shame of every Canadian stands this infamy called Canada Park built with Canadian tax deductible dollars on the ruins of these three villages and this is a war crime and yet our government allows not only our name to be associated with this mm -hmm. infamy but in fact, our tax deductible dollars yeah. were used to build this Canada Park. Yeah. Fifteen million dollars were collected by the sure. Canadian G G Jewish National Fund mm -hmm. to build the Canada Park uh, in 1975. Mm -hmm. and, this, and this is this is uh, a, a terrible uh, thing. And as I said in my uh, agony here in 1978, when I saw this being treated as humanitarian work yeah. at, a, at a, a banquet dinner held to honor yeah. uh, Mr. Mr. Peter Hershon, Hershon yeah. um, for, the, for uh, creating this, this uh, Canada Park. 
and was attended by the Premier of Nova Scotia, the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, and the Mayor of Halifax. And I wrote and objected to this, and I said, since when has this has, has the creation of uh, uh, picnic areas on the ruins of people's homes been considered a humanitarian, humanitarian <laughs> work and, and, uh, and uh, uh, human rights and so on? Yeah. But uh, no, to no avail, nobody listens. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I was surprised really, I didn't know that before, but today I was doing some uh, search on, on Canada Park, you know, although, you know, I read about it quite a bit and, you know, uh, uh, I heard lots from you and from the documentaries you made, uh, uh, which we'll, we'll announce later about if people want more information. But I was surprised, you know, that in '75, John Diefenbaker went to Israel. He is the uh, 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 late uh, Prime Minister of Canada. He went and opened a road leading to the park named after him. John Diefenbaker <laughs> Road, you know, yes. which is <laughs> yes, that's right. and, and the sign at the at this at the Canada Park is still stands to to show the uh, Diefenbaker. Uh, yeah. Way. Yeah, road. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing. And uh, he he was, uh, I believe, uh, a, it's, a it's called the Stephen Baker Parkway. In fact, yeah, it's yeah, called Parkway. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, the road to the park. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's it's really. Uh, it was opened in 1975 by by Stephen uh, Baker himself. Yeah, himself. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised. I didn't know this information. But uh, you know, it's good for the, for our listeners to know all these things because Canada. And again, it, it's it's. Uh, it doesn't make difference really whether they are conservatives or liberals. They behave the same way uh, towards uh, Israeli war crimes. That is supporting them really, supported the peace. I mean, since 1978, I have been writing to Revenue Canada ministers mm -hmm. uh, repeatedly about the allowing the charitable status for the Jewish National Fund while it's committing war crimes by building uh, this and, uh, and its racist practices in, in, in against the, uh, the non-Jewish uh, citizens of the state of Israel and so on, but uh, but to no avail. You uh, you write to them and get nothing heard. And when I write again six months later, they say we are conducting an investigation. When I ask them <laughs> months later. They say it's private. We cannot communicate the results of our investigation. But, but the charitable status of the JNF continues, uh, and so tax deductible dollars uh, go there and being used uh, literally for racist practices against uh, non-Jews in the state of Israel. The mm -hmm. Christians and Muslim citizens of the state of Israel are not allowed to buy or lease any land that's owned by the JNF. Yeah, in, in contradiction of what Mr. Baird said <laughs> at the JNF dinner in Ottawa, that uh, it benefits uh, all Arabs, uh, Jews, and Christians even. <laughs> you know, uh, again, yeah. that's, uh, that's, that's a big true. lie. It is a big lie. I, I, it is a big lie, yeah. yeah because, you know, he's a, he was basically whitewashing uh, Israeli war crimes. Well, I mean, this is, this is, what, is uh, what is infuriating, is that we in Canada continue to brag about being a country that upholds international law and human rights and the United Nations Charter, and yet we allow these violations of international law to go uh, without mere criticism, let alone any action. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's hypocrisy when you hear that yes, talk about other, other countries and violation of human mm -hmm. rights in other countries that don't agree with them. Uh, you know, you, you really, uh, you know, worked a lot about this. And recently, last week, actually, we interviewed Ron Saba, who got some information under the Freedom Information Act, uh, that they really were more interested in covering up uh, the story about the GNF and that they were trying uh, not to uh, reach the mainstream media more than uh, the legality of what they are doing. Uh, and he, he, got, uh, we, he talked about that in uh, last, uh, last week's uh, uh, interview with Ron Saba, and we encourage our listeners to listen to it because uh, it shows uh, not just that, but also uh, certain uh, employees in the foreign ministry uh, telling uh, the officials in the, uh, in the uh, you know, the... Um, 
Revenue Canada to spy on people and on meetings <laughs> because they are opposing the mm. Jewish National Fund. And uh, yeah. it was exposed uh, again by uh, Ron Saba. But, uh, you but Ron Saba has, has done a lot of good yeah. work uh, looking into this and writing to the authorities about it, but to no avail again. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And uh, it takes actually more than just few individuals. And again, uh, they, they are really worried that the public uh, knows about it. And this is our role, is to expose, uh, to expose this uh, uh, support for Israeli war crimes to the Canadian public. Because mm -hmm. once they... Once I, mean, they I mean, this is the uh, agony of his all. You see, I, every people of the my own villages, myself and my family and the people of them was in the other bit uh, are in continuous pain, wanting to return to their land and to their homes and so on, mm -hmm. but they're not allowed to do, despite the fact that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights dictates the right of people to, to be allowed to return to their homes mm -hmm. and the refugees' uh, right, and repeated the United Nations uh, resolutions uh, affirm that, but to no avail again. Yeah. Um, actually, if uh, people want to learn more about this infamous uh, Canada Park, there is two documentaries were made. One of them uh, was with you, with the CBC, I believe, Fifth Estate, was it? Yes, In the CBC Fifth Estate program In published 19... this on the 21st of October 1991. It was broadcast yeah. in, in, in October 1991. It's called Park with No Peace. Yeah. It was uh, on the Fifth Estate, the CBC uh, TV program. And then there is Al-Haq. She did another uh, documentary, which is recently, three, four years ago, I believe. It's called Memory of the Cactus. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's uh, also an excellent one. And both, yes, both I think, that. the people can uh, get them uh, from YouTube, I believe, or, uh, you know, they are posted on you, or some of them. Uh, you. I'm sure uh, the CBC... Well, the Canada Park... Um, documentary yeah. uh, on the Fifth Estate and CBC has a link on my website oh, and it's available good. there. Can you tell us your website, please? Yes, http colon two forward slashes Isaid one word yeah. dot tripod dot com Isaid uh, one word and Yes, I-Z-A-Y-I-D yes, one word yeah. dot tripod dot com yeah. Okay. Uh, that, uh, and there's a link there for the Canada Park yeah. uh, Fifth Estate uh, documentary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure I've seen uh, also some link to the uh, memory of the cactus. And uh, actually, we have a copy. So if people are interested, they could ask us, and we could lend it to them, uh, memory of the cactus, and they could see it and judge for themselves, really, of this uh, uh, really, uh, you know, the least it could see, I could say about it. It is a complicity in war crimes, uh, nothing more. Not mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, this uh, Jewish National Fund uh, raises funds every year, and it's it's and they they say that on their website that uh, not just the donations, but also part of the ticket is tax deductible. Part of the ticket they they pay. Uh, actually, the the ones here in Vancouver, the ticket is two hundred fifty dollars and up up to thirty thousand or ten thousand. I'm not sure. And they saying if you want to donate more, just contact them. They they're willing to accept any amount. So and this is uh, all tax deductible, and they do it. All all across Canada. Uh, there is one in Vancouver, and there is uh, the, on the 9th uh, uh, of this month, which is uh, this Sunday, and one in uh, Montreal uh, on the 12th. And in both places, there are going to be pickets. And, you know, there is one in December. I don't know why they're doing it in December, not in the same month, because this, this week, they, this uh, 10 days, uh, they had all sorts of... Um, uh, fundraising dinners, they call the, them the Negev dinners. Uh, um, and, uh, but they're doing the one in Toronto in December where the Prime Minister 
Harper will be speaking at. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> this is the first time I hear of a sitting prime minister uh, attending uh, the um, uh, GNF uh, uh, dinner. Uh, again, as we said, uh, basically supporting Israeli war crime. What do you think of such a position from uh, the prime minister? Well, I think uh, any governmental uh, support for the activities of the JNF, including the registered uh, charity status, uh, is in violation of international law and uh, should not be supported by any governmental authority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, what's happening, uh, you know, with the Oslo process and with the authority, which is really, uh, I mean, it's an oxymoron to call it authority because they have authority not even on the water, even municipal authorities they don't have. So uh, what do you think, uh, and we, where, where are we going as, as a Palestinian people and as a Palestinian nation? Well, I think this is a tragedy again, that the Palestinian people, uh, their rights have been violated by Israel and the Zionist ideology, and, uh, and this is now uh, allowed to continue by the authorities of the so-called Palestinian Authority, uh, collaborating with the uh, Israeli forces, uh, and uh, continuing this charade about a peace process and so on, and continuing making um, uh, concessions. And uh, at first, I mean, f at first, uh, we, Palestinian, uh, the PLO and the Palestinian Authority uh, accepted that 78%, given legitimacy for 78% of Palestine to be occupied by Israel and then just demanding the remaining 22%, which is the West Bank and Gaza. But nowadays they're even talking about creating swaps, that, that they will, Israel will be allowed to, con to retain the large areas of settlements around Jerusalem and elsewhere, and so on. And they're making the continuous concessions. Uh, there is nothing left, and yet they're getting nothing. Israel, um, Mr. Netanyahu, clearly says he does, he's not interested in a real uh, Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. And uh, the withdrawal of the, uh, the set of settlements, the illegal colonies that Israel created in the illegally occupied territory, um, uh, will, will not take place. Mm -hmm. And it was just the charade of continuing the uh, peace process uh, uh, is... Uh, is a, is a disgraceful uh, act, uh, and, but our authorities and our leaders allow this to continue. And the Arab leaders mm -hmm. uh, from outside stand uh, watching and, uh, in, in total uh, disregard to international uh, uh, law and the rights of the Palestinian not, people. Not just that, they are normalizing relations and, uh, and, uh, and building economic ties <laughs> with, uh, Absolute, with Israel, absolutely. which is again supporting Israel. They are not even respecting the uh, call for boycott divestment sanction uh, that the, the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the popular uh, um, rank and file organization organizations, uh, Palestinian organizations, 170 of them called for uh, mm -hmm. in 2005. Uh, what do you think of this call? Is it, uh, is it the way to go and uh, Which one? The, the, the boycott divestment sanction? Obedience. Well, I think this is a very important uh, peaceful action uh, that, uh, I mean, our resistance must remain peaceful, but uh, I think effective uh, peaceful resistance uh, can work, and hopefully, if it's supported by the international community, will bring action. The, um, the activities of boycott of uh, products uh, from Israel, like in the, uh, the action that was taken against uh, racist practices of South Africa, the apartheid, worked, were effective and worked, and there is no reason why they cannot work against Israel. If fully implemented by the Arab countries and the international community. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is our only hope, is to maintain this 
action and uh, hopefully uh, some justice will be uh, obtained. Yeah, um, I'm really optimistic, uh, Dr. Zayed, and I think, uh, you know, uh, there is lots of uh, support coming out even from within the Jewish community, especially the young uh, of them. Mm -hmm. And also I'm hopeful on the other hand because of the revolts all across the Arab world. And the third thing, the empire, the U.S. empire is collapsing economically and hopefully soon militarily and I hope we see it in our lifetimes. <laughs> well I must say I, I like you uh, feel very pleased that there are good honorable Jewish voices uh, in Israel and in Canada and elsewhere uh, who are uh, standing for justice uh, and uh, human rights. People uh, I have known, uh, Professor Israel Shahak, the late Professor Israel Shahak, he was a great man and he he stood up against uh, the practices of Israel and the Zionist ideology. And there are today many Israelis doing this and many people in Canada, like the Independent Jewish Voice. We have also a group here in Halifax, mm -hmm. Canadians, Arabs and Jews for a Just Peace, including a number of good, uh, honorable Jewish persons who support our cause and against Israeli practices. It's, it is our hope that this will continue and bring about uh, justice and peace. Yeah, actually, I want to make a plug for Voice of Palestine because mentioning Israel Jahak, we have a unique interview with him on the Voice of Palestine, which is recorded on our website. People just Israel Jahak? Yeah, with Israel yeah. Jahak. We interviewed yeah. him in 1993, and yes. he, he, he predicted the Oslo process. We interviewed him two months after the Oslo process. Although He was a great man. Yeah. He was a great man. Yeah, we didn't I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying he was a great man. I met him in in Scotland in in, in 19, uh, 1970 in 1970 yes 70, uh, We were both invited speakers in university in Scotland, and I asked him how did he come to to be involved in this issue. He was a professor of organic chemistry yeah. at the Hebrew University. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I came as an immigrant from the Belgian concentration camp uh, to Palestine in 1946. I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I went to the Hebrew University and uh, so on. He said, but in 1967, um, after the uh, illegal Israeli occupation, he was visiting Bir Zayt University near Ramallah, mm -hmm. and there was a demonstration of um, a demonstration of Palestinian students at the university, and he said the Israeli police force came and arrested about 20 of them, mm -hmm. and took them to the Israeli police station. He said, after I finished my work at the university, I went to the police Ramallah station to see what happened to these students, and he said to my agony. The, uh, the Israeli police stood them uh, across the wall and had each one of them spank the face of his colleagues, one after the other, slapping the faces of each other, mm -hmm. one after the other, one after the other. Then he said they made them lie down on the floor and had every one of them walk on top of his colleagues. He said this is exactly what the Nazis did to us, mm -hmm. and I determined from that day onwards to fight Zionism to my dying day, and that's what he did. And he passed away in 1995 mm -hmm. after a struggle that was enormous, and he was a great man. Yeah, he was, yeah. And as I said, we interviewed him in November 1993, just two months after the Oslo Accord, and the interview, people could listen to it on our website, just Google his name or search his name on our website. Uh, we interviewed him about uh, Israel trade, uh, in armaments, you know, uh, the subject that was. But I asked him about what he thinks of the Oslo Accord, uh, because it was just signed. And mm. he basically said, the Israel wants uh, another village league from the PLO, the, or he wants the PLO to become a village league. And that's what mm. really happened, really. They became yes. traitors and collaborators. And yes. uh, really, I thank you, uh, Dr. Zayed, for talking with us. And if you have a final word uh, to our listeners. My, my final word is, is um, without justice, there will be no peace. And it's my hope 
that there should be a ju- justice for the Palestinian people. Uh, the Palestinian people are only asking for a modicum of justice at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is what is the uh, objective that we must all support. In my opinion, I'm also optimistic because I feel Zionism is running against the natural course of history, and like appetite, it will pass away. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, and keep up the good work. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that was Hana Kawas speaking with Dr. Ismail Zayed from Halifax. And with that, we conclude another edition of The Voice of Palestine. I've been your co-host, Marian Kawas, and our final piece of music is by Jewish-American singer-songwriter David Rovix, entitled Occupation. We dedicate this song to the Palestinians of Beit Nuba, Imwas, and Yalul, and to all the Palestinian people as they struggle against the continuing ethnic cleansing of their homeland. Insist on asking.